In Australia's iconic outback, an environmental disaster is unfolding. When you threaten my family and threaten my future, and you threaten the world's future of feeding our nation and other nations around the world, then you can't get more personal than that. The Darling River, a main artery of Australia's Murray-Darling Basin, is drying up. Some blame climate change, others the growth of industrial-scale cotton farming. Whatever the cause, the result is sparking outrage on social media. Look at these iconic fish of Australia being treated like this. You just have to be bloody disgusted with yourself, you politicians and cotton grower manipulators. These lakes should never be drained. They should be... With national elections due in May, a recent Royal Commission report containing revelations of government bungling, corporate greed and corruption has thrust the issue to the forefront of Australian political debate. With politicians ducking for cover, the worst environmental catastrophe in Australia's history looms large. The empty rivers are threatening not only the nation's food security, but more than 40,000 years of subsistence living by its native people. It's a man-made drought we're living in now. We just all suffer. And it's not just black people, it's everyone, white people and all. And it's got to stop. Ten years ago, after the worst drought in living memory, I travelled to Australia's outback to investigate a water crisis that was described then as exceptional. A decade later, I've returned to find communities on the edge of disaster and facing the possibility the water crisis is permanent. This landscape is at the heart of the battle over Australia's scarce water supply. A nation which likes to call itself the lucky country is endowed with a fabulous wealth of natural resources. But when it comes to one of the essentials of life, the country is in deep trouble. Water's never been plentiful here, but growing demand, mainly from farming, and higher temperatures linked to climate change have collided to create the country's worst ever water crisis. The Murray-Darling Basin drains more than a million square kilometres of southeastern Australia. A network of tributaries flow into the Darling River, which crosses the region to join the Murray River, Australia's longest at more than 2,500 kilometres. The Darling also feeds the Menindee Lakes. Australia's most important agricultural region relies on these rivers and lakes, but after the hottest summer on record, most of the Darling River has run dry and the lakes are virtually empty. For millennia, the Menindee Lake system has been a flourishing ecosystem on the driest continent on Earth and a vital lifeline for the outback. But that has all changed. Just a few years ago, these lakes were almost 90% full. But after a decision by the New South Wales State Government to decommission the lakes for water storage, they were drained dry, and this is the result. As Australia's drought has worsened and with nothing in reserve, the Darling River is now reduced to a few stretches of stagnating water. In December and January, at the peak of summer, a series of massive so-called fish kills, when more than a million fish died, left the country reeling. This has nothing to do with drought. This no. is a man-made disaster brought to you by the New South what? Wales Government, the Federal Government and the Murray-Darling hey. Authority, oh. Basin Authority. This is the result of draining the Manini Lakes twice in four years and killing the system. Hand back, hand back behind us. Oh. These are just two of the many. 
This is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. In nearby Menindi, population 550, residents are being forced to rely on bottled water and watch the local wildlife disappear. With each new fish kill, local fisherman Graham McCrabb has witnessed the devastation. There was just fish all the way down through here in clumps and it was pretty well connected for 30 kilometres of river, just dead fish. Uh, I saw the pictures of the, the little barnies all in pools, but they were just scattered everywhere here like confetti through this section of the river. We'd had a stinking hot week of it, probably seven or eight days, over 45, a couple of days close to 50. And uh, we dropped to about 20 degrees overnight that night. And uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's hard to say really. It's still emotional now for a lot of people, I'd suggest probably two or three weeks on. With entire species of native fish under threat, government fisheries staff mounted a desperate last minute rescue bid. But there was little left to salvage. With the water level continuing to drop, Graham travels the few remaining stretches looking for fish in distress in water made toxic by algae. I'm angry that we haven't got an embargo in place, that irrigation is going to come first, and then they're going to look to see if they embargo the water to come down the river. Surely there should be an embargo on the water to get connection of the of the Barwon River to all the way through the Darling to the Murray, that should be first and then visit it if there's enough water for irrigation. I can't believe that anyone can sit there and say that an embargo isn't in place at this stage. It's devastating now when you realise that it's a, the nursery, the golden perch and silver perch for the whole Murray-Darling Basin. 80% of the golden perch come from here. This is the nursery, they're recruited here and it's just been smashed by uh, these fish kills and and just no help and, and no real political desire to take the environment into account with any decisions or any policies going forward. In 2009, I first travelled along the Darling and Murray rivers. Already in crisis, the Murray River no longer made it to the sea. The mouth of the river in South Australia had run dry, setting off alarm bells across the country. A $7 billion project, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, was drawn up with the hope it would help manage the scarce water resources for everyone. Ten years on, the plan appears to have failed. Both the state and federal governments have been eager to label this crisis as a natural ecological event that's been exacerbated by the big drought there's growing evidence that systematic mismanagement and the uncontrollable theft of water resources has played a huge role in this outback river disaster. In 2018, the South Australian State Government ordered a Royal Commission report into the effectiveness of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. The federal government refused to give evidence and prevented its agriculture officials from appearing before the inquiry. The report was published in February, just weeks after the death of an estimated million fish. It found gross maladministration and negligence at both state and federal levels, along with unlawful activity have undermined the integrity of Australia's greatest river system. One hundred kilometres upstream from Menindee at the town of Wilcannia, the Darling River has long ago run dry. More than a century ago, this town was one of Australia's busiest inland ports with hundreds of paddle steamers plying the river, laden with produce from the land. More than 60% of the town's residents are Aboriginal, most of them from the Barkindji tribe, known as the people of the river. A long time ago, before I was born, my mum was a young girl. My grandmother cut a canoe out of there, see? Out of this, out of this here. She took the bark away, and that's how big the canoe was. 
With his family history etched along the banks of the Darling, Badger Bates, a Barkindji elder, shares his people's intimate connection with the river. See, even the animals are dying. And one of our concerns is the mussel shells, see? The old mussels. They're just dying. Well, this has proved that the water sharing plan is not worth the piece of paper it's written on, and they're just a bunch of liars what wrote the plan up, because look, look what they've given us. They've made the mess, they clean it, and they fix it. You can drink it. A little bit brackish, but it's good water. Although the Bakinji people have native title to their lands, their rights don't extend to the river water, which his people call the Barker. In 2015, they gave us native title of the recognition that we are the Bakinji people. And we say, what's the good of giving us native title and taking our water? The river is our mother, it owns us. We don't own the river. According to Aboriginal legend, the river was created by a Dreamtime serpent which scoured the land, joining up the waterholes. For the Barkindji people, the imminent death of a river they consider their mother is a catastrophe that's difficult to comprehend. We just all suffer. And it's not just black people, it's everyone, white people and all. And it's got to stop. Under the government's Murray-Darling plan, public money is spent buying backwater from farmers. But the last release of so-called bought backwater was almost a year ago. With billions of dollars allocated to fund the water buyback scheme, questions are now being asked about how the money is being spent. This March, a peer-reviewed study produced by Australia's National University found the federal government had grossly exaggerated the amount of water that had been bought back and returned to the environment. In fact, it found that less than 10% of the water the government claimed was being returned ever reached the river. It's said that modern Australia was built on the sheep's back. 150 kilometres downstream from Badger Bates' home, sheep farming is on the verge of collapse. At Talano Station, farmer Rob McBride is seeing his family's future evaporate before him as the water crisis worsens. It seems big corporates and big industries are killing the Murray-Darling Basin, and we are just one of the many who are being absolutely devastated by what they're doing. We're borrowing the country from our kids. We are, and it's being destroyed. For Rob's son, James, the stakes are high. I'll, I'm gonna fight as much as I can so that I do have a future on here, because I was born and brought up on this place. I love it. I know every inch of it, and I love every part of it. I love the country. I love being able to ride down along the river and see beautiful big gum trees and healthy sheep, kangaroos and wildlife everywhere. But we can't have that if things keep going the way they're going. For more than a decade, state governments have developed a complex system of water trading, with most water going to the highest bidders, leaving less for the environment. It's a system which many believe has encouraged corruption. We need the federal government to step in here because they need, you need a broader scope of the whole thing. Each state is only looking at itself when you need to look at the big picture so that you can spread water across all the states equally rather than one state pulling in all the water and being like, oh, we're good, we don't need to worry about the other state because they don't worry about the other state, they worry about themselves. Good day everyone, Kate McBride here from Tolano Station. Today I'm James' sister Kate has taken the battle online. Communities and people along the river need to be put before opportunistic crops like cotton. So we need people to get onto their politicians right now and encourage them to place embargoes in New South Wales. 
She's been travelling the length of the dying Darling River to document the devastation. Now we need to remember that 2019 is the year where our votes will count. Unfortunately, climate change in Australia right now seems to get um, largely avoided by a number of the parties. I think it is set to become a larger issue. Right now, it's not highly enough um, put on the radar, but it is inevitable that our climate is changing. Right now in Australia, we've got flooding in Queensland, we've got massive drought over almost 100% of New South Wales, and Tasmania is on fire. With the rivers running dry, the focus has turned to the upper reaches to the north where massive irrigated farms are mostly growing cotton, a famously thirsty crop. It's heartbreaking to see that this water should be going down the Darling. It's the controversial practice of floodplain harvesting, where rainwater is diverted from streams and rivers and stored, which has come under the spotlight. In particular, in the state of Queensland, where it's almost completely unregulated. On the New South Wales-Queensland border, the town of Gundawindi is thriving. This is cotton country, and the wealth the industry creates is clear to see. But scratch the surface, and it's clear that water, and lots of it, underpins that success. I've travelled to the giant floodplains of southern Queensland to meet a cotton farmer turned whistleblower who decided to speak out after he says his livelihood and that of his neighbours was nearly destroyed by industrial scale cotton farming. Oh yeah, I've really put myself out there. I've, I've fronted lobby groups, I've fronted neighbours, I've fronted friends. Uh, you know, that's where I went to first. I, be I believe that it was my problem letting the river run could have just been dealt internally uh, but that I, I received no help no one no one bothered to lift a finger this is the McIntyre River it's um, New South Wales on one side Queensland here so we're in Queensland we're right in here. Queensland here those trees there in New South Wales and the point is the river's very small the river has to flood out over this country and I, and I want it to be protected this water's being intercepted so when it comes out over this floodplain like it, it has to, it's just being intercepted, called flood water and taken. But the longer you hold it, the more you can take. So that's what's happened to my family. It's just been held on us. Uh, you know, our crops are all destroyed and the water does not continue into the river. So that's, for us to survive as farmers, we just want the river to run. My neighbour can't get stock in domestic water. You know, we're on a big river here that's running full steam within three k's, he can't get water and they've been there for four, genera four generations. For years as Chris toiled with so-called dryland cotton crops that rely purely on rainfall, he says a huge industrial scale cotton farm was diverting water from the McIntyre River into a network of channels and dams. You know, you just can't turn communities off. I think you've got to look after people, you've got to look after the environment, and, and extraction should always come last. Over the last 10 years, as hundreds of kilometres of giant levees and channels were built, Chris took his concerns to the authorities and other cotton growers, but he was ignored and ostracised. But my moral compass won't let me stop. You know, it's been, I've been called a crusader. I'm on a crusade trying to, you know, fix a problem with a, uh, you know, with a neighbour. But it's so much bigger than that. Cotton, it's a franchise. It's like owning a McDonald's. Every crop, it's a prescription. Add water and you can roll out huge acres. That's the difference. Welcome, With public awareness of the crisis gaining traction, the McBride family have decided to take their fight to save the Darling River to Australia's largest city, Sydney. I get attacks from people sometimes saying I speak with too much emotion, but when you see your homeland dying, it is absolutely heartbreaking. These people, I think, need to come out and see a million dead fish in front of their doorstep and speak to the people that are 
living off these bottled waters that have seen the river decline their entire life. Because I have and I'm only 20. Um, I have a great connection to the land, just as many Barkindji people have an even greater one. Um, and that includes the river that sustains it. And so for me, I do speak with emotion because it, it, it's my home. With state and um, national governments failing to provide answers, events like this are raising awareness in the cities of the crisis in the bush. We didn't have the guts to stand up to politicians, to say that we had enough. Why are you not listening to First Nation people? I'm a Muslim, just like my sister over here. She belongs to the land. She's got connection to the land. And she cries when she speaks, and I cry when I speak. So our connection goes through our blood, through our heart. It's where we stamp our feet. Our feet are touching the earth. G'day everyone, uh, my name is Adam Day from Cotton Australia and uh, thanks for the opportunity. With big uh, irrigators uh, now firmly uh, under the spotlight, uh, industry uh, body welcome. Cotton Australia uh, is keen to deflect uh, blame. Uh, I did welcome the, the comments there that people actually are understanding that it's not about the crop that grows and it's about the water. I think that's, uh, that's good. Unfortunately, sometimes some of their rhetoric uh, is very much aimed at our growers and that's been very disappointing because um, you know, these are hard-working farmers, just like uh, all our rural producers, and, uh, and uh, you know, they have been demonised. I spent a day in the box at the South Australian Royal Commission. We're not, we're not afraid to get out there and tell the story. I acknowledge it's a, you know, it is a, a natural disaster out there uh, on the Darling, but, um, you know, we do need to work towards solutions, and that's what, you know, we're really sort of looking at. Uh, the one thing I, I would say is, uh, coming up to the question, is that... Um, we're fully supportive of the recovery of the water. As Australia's water wars rage, there are calls to establish a federal royal commission. Too far. Right now, demands for an immediate suspension of water trading and an embargo on further irrigation across the eastern states of Australia grow louder. This one is, um, means a lot to us as Barkindji people our river, our, our culture, our life. And without no river, there is no life. If they could help us get our water back, because the water means a lot to us black people, and I don't think we're gonna have the same life like Dad did drinking out of the river, because it's all dirty now, not clear.